we all search for something. The tangible, the inanimate, even the invisible. As fleeting as a new car, the perfect career or holiday. We search, we chase, we repeat. It is in this cycle we find the search yields little fulfillment or purpose at all. Yet, somehow, we are all drawn. Somehow, we keep looking. So what if there's more? What if this insatiable desire was befitting a purpose? This eternal pulling, beyond physical, stronger than a feeling or closer than a brother. What if the search was over? What if our true desire was to be found? welcome to you today whether you're new whether it's your first time tuning in or if you call Found Church your home church. Today is Father's Day and on behalf of Found Church I want to say happy Father's Day to all of our dads our granddads our uncles and our spiritual dads tuning in. We want to say that we honour you that we love you and that we're grateful for you. We have a good service lined up with even a little treat right at the end and we pray that you enjoy, that you feel part of what's happening and that you encounter God right where you're at today. I also understand that this day might be a little bit tough for some people and if that is you, I pray that you will feel God's comfort, that you'll feel God's peace and that you'll feel him to be extra close to you today. Kirsty and Gregor are going to lead us in worship but before that, let's pray together. Dear Father, we just thank you that you're here. We thank you that you want to meet with us and that you want to encounter us today. I pray for every single person tuning into our service. May they be surrounded by your love, God, and may they feel peace and, and comfort. And as we celebrate dads, I pray, Father, that they would feel extra blessed. And for anyone that's finding it tough, Lord, I pray that you would surround them with your love as well. God, we give you praise and give you honour because you're so good in your name. Good morning church and happy Father's Day. Let's lift our voices this morning and just sing where you are this morning. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what a Saviour has done. Great thing. 
you'd conquer the grave You'll free every captive and break every chain Oh God, you have done great things We'll dance in your freedom, awake and alive Oh Jesus, I sing your name lifted high Oh God, you have done great things
bears my shame There is one who leads me out of darkness Just one day Jesus, only you. In your arms, I cannot Thank you very much, Kirsty and Gregor. That was great. And welcome again to every one of you to our service today. Just want to say that we'll be doing communion in a short while. But before that, we're going to hear a short, inspiring testimony from Matthew Cunningham. Good morning, church, and happy Father's Day um, to all the men and dads out there. Uh, my name is Matthew Cunningham. I'm married to the beautiful Joanna, and I have three lovely kids. First is Timothy. He's five years old. And then I have Caleb, who's four years old, and baby Anna, who is two years old. Um, there's been lots that I've learned in this journey of being a, uh, being a dad. And um, one thing I've learned is, is uh, just how deep and the patience and love God has for me. Um, uh, also, I've learned the preciousness of time and time management and uh, also to enjoy the simple things in life like going for a walk in the park a meal around the table or making silly faces um, just the things that bring joy in life um, but one of the major lessons that i've learned on this journey has uh, has been to trust god as my father and uh, at the end of the day god knows me better than i know myself and he knows how to take me from strength to strength um, but it's not always easy to trust God with our lives and especially if our lives are so deeply connected to uh, to those around us like mine is to Joanna and the three kids and so every action or decision I make has a, has a big effect on them and the responsibility is higher 
But there was a time uh, a couple of years ago where uh, where God um, put this trust to the test. Um, I was on a journey of self discovery and self control, and and throughout that journey, um, my natural gifting seemed to rise to the surface, and I also had a clearer vision and clear. Uh, idea of God's plan for my life and and purpose and at least the next few steps, and uh, and it, that was great, um, but the reality of life was uh, very real and a full time job and we had two or three other uh, side projects to earn some money to to keep us afloat and pay the bills and and take care of the never ending list that just seemed to to grow and grow. Um, we for instance we needed a we needed a dryer and we needed a dishwasher and we needed a uh, a bed our bed was broken and um and then on top of all of this i felt god tell me that still small voice came and he said stop all their side projects and just continue work as a postman i want you to spend more time with your family and i want you to pursue um, the path and the next steps that i have for you and I was like, oh, well, obviously being the uh, provider for the family, um, I had a few reservations with this request. And uh, I discussed with God um, the importance of wisdom in this situation and the role of, uh, you know, making a path sure. And, uh, and so after hearing my point, I felt God saying again, impatiently, um, you need to stop those extra jobs and focus on what I have for you. And I decided that it was probably wisest to obey God in this situation. And, uh, and so I did. And so I finished the other projects and I just continued to be a postman. And it did free up a lot of time. Um, the bills didn't go away and the things didn't go away, but I had more time for my family and I had enough time to study and and pursue uh, the plan that I felt God had put on my heart. And then a funny thing happened. Um, within a few weeks, we uh, we received the gift of a dryer. We received a hundred pounds from a person we barely knew. We received a two hundred and fifty pound tax rebate that we weren't expecting. We had our bed. And we came across our dream dishwasher uh, for an incredibly low price on Gumtree, which we quickly snapped up. Um, and basically we learned in a very real way that God was the provider for our family and not just me or Joanna. And um, really took care of us, really took care of us. Um, now the lesson here wasn't to quit work, that wasn't the lesson at all, um, but the lesson is that if God calls us to do something, or if he calls us to be something, he is more than able to provide, to provide for it. And so, um, in finishing, I'd like to encourage you with uh, some verses that I really feel, um, look at this, and I'll just read them just now. It's from Matthew uh, 625 therefore I tell you do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink or about your body what you wear isn't there more to life than food more to the body than clothing look at the birds of the sky they do not sow or reap or gather into barns yet your heavenly father feeds them aren't you more valuable than they are which of you by worrying can add even one hour to his life. So then, don't worry saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the unconverted pursue these things, your, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Above all, pursue his kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So then, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. So I just want to encourage you, stay close to God, put his kingdom first and enjoy, uh, enjoy fatherhood 
And uh, we love you and we miss you and look forward to seeing you all soon. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you, Matthew. We heard your sister a couple of weeks ago. You are a tremendous family. And uh, we thank God for each and every one of you. And uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago that we're going to be breaking bread now in just a quick verse for you from 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And on this Father's Day, we want to celebrate his, his fatherhood, his goodness towards us the Father who sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And so we take the bread this morning that reminds us of the body of Jesus that was broken for us. Uh, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And we take the bread this morning that reminds us of that tremendous sacrifice for us that the Lord Jesus made on the cross. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for going to the cross for us to pay the ultimate price for us. We bless you this day. On this Father's Day, Father God, we celebrate your marvelous love that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Bible tells us that after supper, at first Passover, the Lord Jesus took the cup, and the Bible says that he told us to do this in remembrance of him that this cup symbolizes his blood that was shed for us. We remember his great sacrifice for us. There's a verse of a hymn that says, Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. And we thank God this morning for the blood of Jesus and all that it accomplished for us. Father God, this morning, we just take a moment again to thank you for that amazing sacrifice for that body that was broken, for that blood that was shed, for that outstanding love that you showed for us. Lord, how, Lord Jesus, you willingly went to the cross and gave up your life for us. And on this Father's Day, we thank you for reconciliation with Father God. We thank you that we were like the prodigal and we found our way back into your family. And we celebrate that this morning with these symbols of bread and wine to remind us of your amazing sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we're going to hear on this Father's Day some special greetings from a great friend of uh, Found Church, from Gary Davidson, who's going to be greeting us uh, all the way from Texas. Thank you, Gary. Greetings, Found Church, from a balmy 33-degree Dallas, Texas, to your 18 degrees in Larbert. It must be fantastic. Anyway, Gary and Wilma and I here quarantining, trying to stay safe for this pandemic passes. With a special greeting to my good friend, Michael, his lovely wife, Diane, and their brilliant family who thankfully took after their mother's side of the family. It's Father's Day, so wishing you a very blessed Father's Day. Just want to share a little story with you. Saturday, last Saturday, I uh, spoke at a funeral service for a dear friend called James Sassnett. James and I were actually raised together in a small community in central Oklahoma. And then after we graduated from high school, didn't see each other for probably 30 years or more. I walked into a Pentecostal church about 25 years ago in Oklahoma City, and uh, there he stood, hugged my neck, shared his story. Uh, he had wandered far from God, went through a couple of failed marriages, and then by the grace of God, was driving around one night in a desperate feeling and uh, saw the Assemblies of God Church, went into that church at the close of the service, responded to the altar call, gave his life to the Lord, and began to live for God. James was also a barber, and he became my barber for nearly 25 years. And many times I'd be sitting in the chair while he was working away on my curls, and he'd talk to me about his daughter, Kim, who had went through a very difficult time. He and Kim's mother had divorced when she was only two, and uh, he tried to keep as much contact as he could. And at times felt like he failed. And I think sometimes we do that as fathers. We don't feel we're as good as we could be and uh, feel challenged by it. But on Saturday at his memorial service, his daughter Kim got up to share. 
She shared about the difficulties she went through, the struggles she went through, the failed relationships she went through, and yet her father always stuck it out with her, sometimes driving 400 miles round trip just to spend the day with her. Did that every other weekend for years. James often shared of his concern for her, but Kim responded, came to the Lord, and at his funeral service, she shared of his faithfulness to her. She's now married to a dentist. They have a little son. She's doing extremely well. I said all that to say this. Sometimes our girls, our sons wander far from the Lord, but our Heavenly Father that brought us home can bring them home as well. I said, there a father in the house. Trust God, believe God. Believe that God's going to bring your children home if they're not home yet. And if they are, do your best and know that your Heavenly Father is there to help you. God bless you, Found Church. Love you. God, you are a blessing, and you've always been a blessing. Thank you for being willing to share with us today on this Father's Day. Thank you. Today, we're going to read from uh, the book of Numbers in chapter 14, just a few verses from verse 7 to verse 9. And just a, a small portion, because I'm going to be reading later on. The land we pass through and explore is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word. Father God, I just pray that what I share this morning will be a blessing and an encouragement to all those who listen now and in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. And I pray that you'll come and just help me, Holy Spirit. Amen. So this is Father's Day, and uh, I'm going to be looking a little bit at that portion that I read earlier on. So if you've got your Bibles and you want to open it at Numbers 13 or Numbers 14, that's where we're going to be concentrating at today. And although this is Father's Day, and there's an aspect of this message that will speak to fathers, I really believe that this message is going to speak to all of us today. The Lord, I believe, laid this message on my heart towards the end of May. And uh, we're beginning to think about exiting lockdown, and maybe by the time we, we've heard this message, uh, we'll be on phase two of lockdown, uh, hopefully. And, uh, but I'm thinking today about stronger in the next season. And... Uh, this incident that happened here was the opportunity of a new season for the children of Israel. And uh, we can take parallels from that into our own lives and learn from their failures and learn from their successes and bring it with us into the next season that we go into. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 to 6 that I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. And then Paul speaks about many other experiences that they happened, but it says that God was not pleased with most of them and their bodies were scattered over the desert. And these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And so the Bible tells us that the, that incident in particular has an impact and can teach us things today. The Bible tells us that we're wiser if we pay attention to these things. Proverbs 28 says, real survivors learn wisdom from others. So this, the background to this story will be very familiar to many of you. And, and many of you would have sung it at Sunday school, that 12 men went to spy in Canaan, and 10 were bad, and two were good. What do you think they saw in Canaan? 10 were bad, and two were good. God's brought these children of Israel out of Egypt. They'd cried out to him in their bondage and in their slavery. And God was now bringing them into the land that he'd promised, that he'd, that he'd taken them out of Egypt to possess. And in our lives, God takes us out of bondage. He takes us out of sin. He can take us out of addiction to bring us into a marvelous place with himself. He can bring us out of COVID to possess a new future that he has for us. And this is the central section in Numbers, the commentators would tell us. The Israelites are encamped right at the southernmost tip uh, near of the promised land. And uh, they're on the verge of entering. Uh, they, are, they are at a place called Kadesh, and they're on the verge of a new season with God. Well, did it go well? Well, no, it didn't really go well. And the first point I would like us to think about today is the need to let go and let God. 
You see, these men went on a mission to spy. And if you didn't have a good commentary and you didn't have margin notes in your Bible, you would actually think that it was God who sent them out. But actually, when we look at the Bible, we find that the people themselves had asked to go out and spy this land that God had promised to give them. In Deuteronomy 1 and 19, we find that, that, that God is saying, See, the Lord your God has given you this land. Go up and take possession of it, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. But then Moses says, Then all of you came to me and said, Let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we will come to. And, and if it was happening in Scotland and in our community, it's as if God was like saying, this is what I'm going to do for you. And you're saying, well, I'm no so sure about that. We want to go and see it for ourselves. And so God allowed them to go and spy out this particular land because they wanted to see what this particular land is like. And that's why I say we need to let go and let God. We need to let God's word and God's spirit lead us and guide us day by day. Not to lean to our own understanding, but to understand that God knows what's best. To walk by faith and not to walk by sight. There's times in my life when God has asked me to do stuff and asked my wife and I to do stuff. And, and, and they did, somehow they didn't make sense. When God told us once to, to trust him uh, to sell our house, it's a big story that I've told often in church. But uh, if we'd known what was ahead of us, then, then it would have been even more scary than it was to do what we did. And, and sometimes we want to know the next chapter and the next chapter, and the next chapter. But we forget that, that our journey with God is a walk of faith, that there's a growing. And, and sometimes if we were to know everything was, that was in front of us, when we're not yet mature enough or ready enough, then it would be even more scary. If Abraham had known that, that God was going to call on him to offer up Isaac, which of course he didn't have to do because God is not into child sacrifice, but God was just wanting to test Abraham to see where he was. I would have imagined when the child was born that, 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 that he would have been abhorred at, the, at the, the very thought and would not have been able even to understand it. The Bible speaks today, commentary says, life is more than a series of disconnected accidents. And believers are not to fret about the unknown. Their part is to live each day to his glory. Discern his will in times of decision and trust him for the guidance he has promised to provide. Don't miss the fact that God said, I'm going to give you this land. We're talking about the promised land. We're talking about the land that the forefathers looked forward to. We're talking about the land that Joseph wanted to be taken to after his death and to be buried there. We're talking about the land that God said he was taking them out of Egypt to possess. And all of those who went up, all of those 12 men who went up were leaders. And God gave them clear instructions, we find in Numbers 13, verses 17 to 20. He says, see what the land is like, if it's good or bad. Whether the people are strong or weak, many or few, what kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled? Are they fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile? Is it poor? Are there trees? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit. And in and, and those days, they didn't have spy drones like we have today. They, they weren't able to spy out like that. They had to go and spy out themselves. And for 40 days, they went about 47 miles north. They covered a, a district of around 500 miles altogether. And they, they, even at Hebron, they, when, they, when they spoke about it later on, and, and it, was, it was probably a, a, an important thing for us to note that it was even there that God had first promised Abraham that he would inherit the land, that he, it was there that he set out to defeat the kings. And, and, and it's got a lot of history about it. And as one commentator says, they were on ground hallowed by memories of God's faithfulness. So did they go in and possess it? No, they did not. They drew back, as we will see in a minute. And, and, and though they brought back these huge grapes from the valley of Eshcol, they, they were not ready to go in. And my first lesson for us today is that we need to learn to let go and let God at every season of our lives. We've got to get to the place where we surrender totally to his will. It says in Matthew 16 and 24 in the message translation, Then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. And many of our songs and our hymns capture this. Thy blessed will divine, with joy I make it mine. Where he may lead me, I will go. It's, it's just letting go 
and letting God, not second-guessing God, but trusting Him. The second thing that I see in this passage is the importance of letting faith arise instead of fear. Don't forget that all of these people were leaders, but instead of responding with faith, they responded, ten of them, with fear. And we may be exiting it, uh, this season and going into another season, and maybe some of you are afraid of what the future might hold. And I pray that this message today will speak faith into you rather than fear. There's a lot of fear in this passage. They went in and they came back and they said, we went to land and it does flow with milk and honey, but I heard it said many years ago by a preacher that sheep say, amen, but goats say, ah, but, and here is a but. And the people who live there are powerful and, and, and the cities are fortified. And, and, and we even saw the descendants of Anak there and on they go. One commentator says, although the report conveys the same ground as the narration. It, 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 it's saying the same thing. It's looted, exaggerated, and calculated to dismay the hearers. And so their interpretation of what they saw, or rather their misinterpretation and representation of what they saw, the people are powerful, the cities are large. And true, they were. But, 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 and, and they brought back fruit. But m make no mistake about it, this was a challenge. But it wasn't bigger than their God. And Caleb silenced the people and gave a positive, faith-filled, can-do response. He, I read it earlier on. He silenced the people. He said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the people chipped back in with discouragement. They spread among the Israelites a bad report. We can't attack these people. The land devours those living in it. The people are of a great size. The descendants of Anak are there. We slime like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. I mean, we, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Did they go up to the people and say, hey, excuse me, sir, but we're going to be taking over your land. What do you think of that? Hey, get away, you grasshopper. No, of course they didn't, they didn't engage with them. They, they are talking themselves out of the blessing of God. We can't. And, and, and they went through a terrible night of crying, grumbling against Moses and Aaron, questioning God, negative prospects regarding the future, a desire to go back to Egypt, and their desire for a new leader. And it's getting a bigger and bigger and bigger mess as they react by fear instead of responding with faith. And they made the problem bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's as if they made God smaller and smaller. And only Joshua and Caleb reacted difficult, differently. And, 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 and they silenced the people. And, and, and they said, the land we possess through and explored is exceedingly good. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land. A land flowing with milk and honey. And he tells them not to be afraid. And, and, and he says, their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. What a powerful statement. If the land is good, that God will help them. Don't rebel against them. Don't fear the people. You've got things back to front. It's we'll swallow them up, not they'll swallow up us up. Their protection is gone. And, and the Lord is with us. And don't be afraid of them. And Caleb, in fact, as we know from later on in the story, kept his, his hopes and dreams alive for a further 40 years. What about the things that God has promised you and me? Are we going to re react by fa fear? Or are we going to respond by faith? Let faith arise, friends. Feed your faith and starve your fear. Let faith arise instead of fear. Thirdly, watch your language or you may get what you declare and belief for. I've mentioned this so many times lately that I'm not going to go into great detail here, but I want you to see again, because I'm not quite sure that we totally understand that, that, that negative speech, negative language can almost be a self-fulfilling prophecy. But the people who live there are powerful, they say. The cities are fortified. They're very large. And, and so they go on, we can't attack. They spread a bad report. We, the land devours the people. Did you get that? You know, all the people, they say, are of great size. We saw the Nephilim. They're making exaggerated claims, intending to put fear into the hearts of the people. And, and as well as talking up the enemy, they badmouthed the land, which God has promised them, and which God said is good. They're actually calling what God has said is good. They're actually calling it bad. And that night they wept aloud and they grumbled and said, if only we died in Egypt or in the desert, 
Why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to let us fall by the sword? And so they go on and on. And the Lord intervened in that. And, and, and he made a pronouncement and a judgment. And you read about that in Numbers 14 and 20. And he says, Not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land. No one has treated me with contempt will ever see it. And, and, and apart from uh, Caleb and Joshua, and, and, and God says that they followed him wholeheartedly. You know, some people think that the whole speech thing is something that belongs only to the faith movement. But the, the, the ESV comments in its Bible, which is a conservative commentary, says, in fact, the disobedient Israelites will get what they asked for. They wanted to return to Egypt. They are told to go into the wilderness by the Red Sea. They did not want to enter the land because they would die there. They are told they will never enter it, but die in the wilderness. Do you see, friends, that they all got what they spoke about, what they all believed for? Some of us, I believe, have been negative so long. It's second nature, and we don't even know it. So the first big lesson, let go and let God. The second one, let faith arise instead of fear. The third one, watch your language or you may get what you declare and believe for. And the fourth one is here, it's not the major, majority voice we need to hear, but it's God's voice. Ten people said it's hopeless. Only two said it was good. That's a majority of five to one. And a lot of people are swayed by popular opinion. Could I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to be swayed by God's opinion, by God's word, rather than what other people's opinions are? We need to be true to God's word and our own God-given convictions. Like the saints of old who triumphed marvelously, like people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, people like Daniel who purposed in their heart and, and, and went against the tide. Friends, we need to be people who, who hear God's voice and stand up for it. And a few months ago, I, I preached from Acts 27 about Paul's shipwreck. And uh, remember, it was the majority decision who decided to sail forth. Let me just say, friends, it's not always popular opinion that counts. It's God's opinion that, that counts. And we need to learn to sit at the feet of Jesus, to quiet in our hearts, our minds, our spirits, to be still and know that he is God, listen to his voice, and let faith arise as we hear his voice and operate it. It's not the majority voice we need to hear, but it's God's voice. And fifthly and finally, to recognize that our decisions have consequences. And this is where I said at the beginning that it has a particular implication for fathers and Father's Day, and of course, mothers as well. The, the, the decision meant that there was missed opportunity. Here they were on the borders of the promised land, and they missed the opportunity to go in. You know, God is inviting us to partner with him, to go into the promised land with him. He invites us to go on a journey with him by faith, to put our trust in the Lord Jesus and to do life with him. I wonder if you've done that. I remember a number of years ago, we had a mission on here in the, in, in the church. And uh, there's a couple of people came along to it. And, and such was the presence of God and, and, and the power of God in the meeting at night. And we would call that the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And they felt that conviction. And as two people went out the road, went down the foundry lawn in their car, and they had to stop because such was the convicting power of God. But they did not bow the knee to Jesus. And I know many, many stories of that, that people come so far. And maybe you've heard over these last few weeks invitational messages that invite us to come and put our trust in the Lord Jesus. And, and, and we, we, we stand back instead of stepping forward and going into all that God has for us. The Bible says that the devil blinds the minds of unbelievers and puts like a veil over our minds so that we do not see the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I wonder if God bringing us to the, to the end, to the, to the verge of something new, to some new adventure in Him, and we are pulling back. You know, maybe it's an adventure in giving. And he's saying it's time that, that, that you learn to give the way the Bible says and be generous that way. Maybe he's calling you into service eh, to go to Bible college, serve in a department of, of church. But no, we want to control our own di diaries and our own, and our own eh, 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 finances. We are afraid of the adventure. Maybe he's calling us and he's taking us to that edge where we know we've got to lift the phone and, and, and say to somebody, I forgive you. 
uh, or, or will you forgive me? To move on from a difficult situation instead of staying part of the old bit, but to enter into the new that God has for us. Maybe he's calling us to, to move in spiritual gifts. I, I've seen God's spirit move in meetings. And I've, and I've felt the weight of his presence and, and, and known his power at work in the midst of our lives. And, 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 and yet other people have gone out of that same meeting totally unaffected. And we need to be open to all that God has for us to go into the land of promise that he invites us to go unto. And finally, the choices we make and the decisions and actions that we take not only affect us, but those who are coming behind us. For 40 years then, everyone had to go round and round in circles in the wilderness. You know, all those 20 years and upwards were going to die because they were the men that were enrolled to fight. And so the decision of the leaders that day and the decision of the people and the judgment that ensued meant that a whole wilderness, a whole, uh, sorry, a whole generation had to go traveling around in a wilderness. And the decisions that we make have a cost. But not to make the decision also has a cost. And, and, and so I want to encourage us today to be stronger in the next season. Whatever God is leading us into in our lives, eh, both, both as a nation and as individuals and as a, as a church. I encourage us to let go and let God, let God lead us and guide us to let faith arise in our hearts and lives and embrace all that he has for us instead of fear, to let our declaration be godly, to watch our language and, and be aware here that they got what they declared and believed for, to let God's voice come through above all others. It's not the majority voice we need to hear, but the Lord's voice. And, and to let it sink into our lives today and recognize that our decisions have consequences. And if we do that, friends, I believe we'll not only be stronger in the next season, but I believe we will be stronger in every season. So let's learn the lessons that we see today from these people who missed the opportunity. Let's embrace all that God has for us in this next season. And let's pray together. And, and I just want to pray for people who have come to the brink of giving their life to Jesus, but have never just taken that step of faith. The old hymn says, only a step to Jesus, why not take it now? Why will you not take that step today and embrace all that God has for us? Don't let fear hold you back, but let faith eh, propel you forwards. Father, I pray for those today who have not given their lives to you, who will be listening to this today, that they will realize that there's a land of promise that you have eh, for us, that we will take the steps that you have ordained for us, that we will put our hand in your hand, that we'll say, Lord Jesus, come into my life, change my life, take, take me by the hand and lead me on a journey that you want to take me in. And for those, Lord, who, who have perhaps walked away, failed to go in, missed the opportunities, but Lord, we thank you that you're gracious and just like Jonah, the word of the Lord can come a second time. May those who have been brought back to a place where there is a window of opportunity to go through and walk into and enter into all the joy that you have, I pray, Father, that people will take that step today and that you will help each and every one of us, Father God, to embrace the future that you have for us that will not hold back, but that will go forward with you, that will let go and let you take control of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, folks, we've got a special treat for you. We've an item from some of the boys and girls on this Father's Day. Enjoy. God bless you.
be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children in his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you Thank you for listening to today's message. We hope it was a blessing. Other Found Church messages are available on Spotify, iTunes and our website foundchurch.co.uk. You can also catch up with previous services via our YouTube channel. We are working hard to keep you connected to us and each other in this season. If you are new, you are also welcome to join us. You can connect with us on social media and via the website. Daily inspirational messages are available on our social media platforms. We are grateful for the ongoing faithfulness of those of you who give regularly. This can still be done via the church website or through the church app, Church Suite. If you require more information on this, please do not hesitate to get in touch. We look forward to welcoming you again to our online service next Sunday. Have a great week.
I love your voice You have led me through the fire And in darkest night You were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of the goodness. 